First, thanks to everyone for joining. Um, so today we have Johannes, Johannes Lotz, who's going to be giving a presentation on registration in computational pathology. So in the TIA seminar series, we haven't yet had a presentation on image registration. So we're really looking forward to your presentation, Johannes. So Johannes is from the, forgive me if I'm not saying this right, the Fraunhofer Institute for Digital Medicine. Yeah, and all right. <laughs> Okay, and he studied computational life sciences at the University of Lübeck and Emory University in Atlanta, and then joined the Fraunhofer Mevis in 2011, where he started to work on registration of images from histopathology. So in 2009, he obtained his PhD, where the title was Combined Local and Global Image Registration and its Application to Large Scale Images in Digital Pathology. So Johannes is addressing the challenge that images in pathology are too large to fit into memory, such that most numerical optimization methods can't be directly applied. So I can see you're now sharing your presentation. So I think you're good to go. So just before you start, is it okay if people ask questions during the presentation or would you rather us wait till the end? Yeah, of course, please just go ahead, uh, interrupt me if anything is unclear. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So I think as we're, running a bit late. I think you can start whenever you're ready. Yeah, okay, thank you, um, Simon, for the introduction. Just one wee little bit. Uh, my PhD is from 2019 and then 2009, a bit more recent. Uh, yeah, so good afternoon for, to everyone. Um, uh, as Simon has pointed out, I am going to talk about uh, image registration and pathology. Um, I'm going to start to say uh, why is it useful, um, how has it been used, how does it work, and then we will get uh, into a bit of a demo and see how it can be best be used uh, and a few conclusions in the end. Uh, most of it of what I'm going to show is joint work with uh, Nick Weiss, Daniel Budelmann and Stefan Heldmann, my co colleagues from Lübeck here, and I guess with this we can just uh, step right in. Okay. So um, about the problem that we uh, try to solve in image registration, we have two sections. So this can be either consecutively cut sections uh, from a tissue block or restained sections where the same, uh, same slide has been bleached and restained. And usually we have two different stains as we can see here. One, we have an H&E uh, on the lower left and um, I think it's a pass stain on the upper right. And yeah, we want to find the corresponding structures in the two images and then align them. And yeah, one of the main problems um, that we can see here is um, so we can zoom in and in and much more in, and we have a lot of detail in the images. We can see individual cells, but we have a ton of pixels. So um, the problem that we need to solve is for one, um, we have these large images, more than 100,000 times 100,000 pixels sometimes, so goes beyond uh, 80 gigabyte of memory if we want to load them incompressed. In and and uh, the second one, and uh, I mean, you, I guess most of you will know all of this, but I'm going to just point it out anyways. Um, when cutting these sections, this is yeah kind of a dirty process and uh, there's a lot of deformation going on. Um, and this deformation um, that is, exerted to the block here. So that needs to be compensated, even though the final slide is much smoother than uh, smoother than what we see here. But we need a lot of nonlinear compensation um, to uh, solve this registration problem. So the application is uh, the same in most cases. So um, we have um, some annotations or some automatically detected image features that, um, such as segmented nuclei um, from maybe a specific immunochemistry strain. If we want to transfer these annotations to another stain, such as the H&E. Um, and so this is basically the same and registration allows exactly this to transfer information from one slide to the other. And there are different applications that become possible uh, once we make this uh, alignment. I want to highlight a few of them. Uh, so this is work uh, from a paper with uh, Mashenka Balkenhor from the Nijmegen group on the assessment of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in breast cancer. 
And the question that was answered here is how is the density of specifically stained lymphocytes in certain tissue areas? So we need two stains, we need the H and E to determine a tissue region. And then we have a multiplexed immune histochemistry to find specific cells in these areas. And then we can like correlate these areas as all these densities in the areas with certain clinical outcome. And um, yeah, this is what has been done here. Um, so this is more like a question from uh, biomarker discovery. Another one uh, also uh, uh, with a group, uh, the DIA group from my opinion with uh, Wouter Balten who has been here in uh, January uh, and talked about his work is a paper about epithelium segmentation and prostate h &E. and so here, this is an application for restained sections. And so what we need to do in prostate cancer is to detect these epithelial cells. They are needed to distinguish benign and malignant tissue. And uh, they are stained using immunistic chemistry. But this is, of course, more work than just to work with the h &E. So the idea here was to train a deep learning network to segment the epithelium in the h &E and use the immunistic chemistry as ground truth for these annotations. Um, and yeah, they did this here and registered the uh, differently stained images and uh, finally came out with a segmentation accuracy, so F1, F1 score of 0 0.89 on the H&E, um, which is only, uh, so in, in they achieved 0 0.92 on the, on the immunistic chemistry. So the detection that was possible on the trained H&E in the end was almost the same as uh, on the immunistic chemistry. And I think this is, uh, pretty impressive. So maybe a third application, um, not sorry, for clinical. I, yeah. I'm sorry. Can I have a question on the previous slide? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a second. I have to... mm -hmm. So as far as I understand, what they did here was that they stained the slide and then they washed it out and restained it again, right? <laughs> so does do we need uh, the formal uh, registration for this case as well. I mean, because the structures are the same. Um, yeah. And in my opinion, it should be like some fine registration needed for this task. Is yeah, there I think so. experience? Yeah. Go ahead. So the answer is yes and no. Uh, and I will come to it in like 10 minutes. So I would just postpone uh, the answer oh, to this sure. question if that's fine. Okay. <laughs> of course. Go ahead. Um, okay, um, so, okay, yeah, a last um, application, um, maybe not for clinical routine, but uh, sometimes useful in uh, research settings. So here's a question, was a tumor budding? Uh, we, we did this with a clinician here in Lübeck. And the question is, is uh, something like, um, are these cells over here? Can you see my mouse? I hope so. Um, are these cells over here connected to the larger uh, block of uh, tumor cells? in this other region. And this is something that is difficult to say in 2D. Um, but what, of course, what we can do and what we did here is to um, rebuild the 3D structure from a block of serial uh, tissue sections. And um, by just registering all of them together and then reconstructing the tissue block. And um, if we then do 3D, we can easily like segment or just threshold uh, this tumor mass here and uh, in 3D, you can actually see all the connections that are going on uh, between these um, different uh, tissue uh, compartments here. Okay, maybe something that I'm not going to talk about, but what is interesting anyway, so these same registration algorithms that we use in pathology are used in a bunch of different medical areas, such as radiotherapy, for example, where you can do interesting stuff, such as um, to model different uh, tissue areas or yeah, materials. Uh, for example, here the bones, and this is uh, visualized by this deformed grid here, uh, the bones in this um, uh, CT image, uh, of course, they don't, so they must not be deformed, right? We don't want to bend the bones due, uh, by registration. So you can actually model uh, that the deformation of this um, of this uh, yeah, heart areas uh, is rigid and then uh, have different tissue parameters for bladder or for prostate, for example. And yeah, this has been done uh, by uh, colleagues. Um, 
for radiotherapy. And then there's um, another topic that has come up in the last years so is registration based on uh, convolutional neural networks. And there's a lot of work going on and these algorithms are pretty fast actually, um, but I'm not so sure about the generalizer generalizability um, but I'm not going to talk about this because I don't know so much about it but if you want to know about it more about this then you can uh, maybe invite one of my colleagues uh, who will be happy to tell you more about it. So now we're going into image registration. Uh, in general it always works the same way. We have an objective function that we call j here um, and we have two images a reference image R, which is also sometimes called fixed image. And we have a template image T, which is uh, also called moving image. And we want to minimize this objective function, which consists of a distance measure uh, that basically measures yeah, how similar are these images given a transformation Y. And the idea is, yeah, as I said, to minimize this and then come up with the optimal transformation um, between these two images. So, what is a distance measure? So how can we measure how similar images are? The most simple one is the sum of square difference, the SSD, uh, which as the name states, just subtracts the two images, squares the difference, and then sums out all of it up, uh, which is uh, pretty simple. It's also relatively quick to compute because there's not much to compute here. Um, so this works pretty well in monomodal registration and monomodal means that we have the same modalities in both images. And um, although one could think that this is the case, at least for same stain registration, um, we often see in pathology staining differences like here where just a section or part of the section is uh, brighter than the other. And this also already violates the assumption that both images are of the same brightness, for example. And so this doesn't work so well for pathology, which is why we use something a bit more sophisticated, which is called the normalized gradient fields. And so the core of it is this term up here, not sure if we um, hope you can, you can read this. So this is a scalar product basically of the gradient of the template and the gradient of the reference image. Um, so we measure the, the gradient, you can think of it as also as edges in the image, for example, and um, so we have the scalar product between the transform template gradient, reference gradient, and then we normalize it uh, just by their norm. So what we do is, so this can also be expressed as a cosine between these two angles, uh, between these two, two gradients. And what we want to achieve is that the gradients of the two images are either just uh, in parallel pointing in the same directions or pointing in the opposite directions. Uh, and yeah, th this distance measure becomes minimal if the overlay or if all the gradients uh, point in the same directions. And this is relatively, due to the normalization, this is relatively independent of uh, standing differences. And uh, so this works pretty well. So we see two images here converted to gray, and then we see this overlaid gradients before registration. You can see the tissue boundaries bit here, uh, and also some structures inside the uh, the tissue before registration. So this is how this uh, basically looks like. And this is what's minimized here in order to bring the images on top of each other. Um, yeah. So for the first distance metric, do you need to define a set of land landmarks? No, so or this... Uh, no, for none of these two work with landmarks. So it always looks at the whole or at all the pixels of the image. Um, Okay, and so would something like this one here be sensitive to the so, for example, if your reference image is H and E, and then your um, your your target image is let's say IHC, would your gradients that you compute be also dependent on these differing stains? Yes, of course. I mean, um, so what the assumption is that we have like corresponding structures in both images, right? So this is what we want to align. And the idea of corresponding structures is that they have like corresponding boundaries, for example, and each boundary would cause a gradient either in one or in the other direction. So it doesn't matter if I go from bright to dark because I have a darkly stained nucleus in the one, one of the two sections, or if it goes from bright to even brighter because this particular nucleus didn't stain for whatever reason. So that's, that, that doesn't matter. But if I have like a gradient at the boundary of the two, Two objects, then this will be visible in the normalized gradient fields gradient here. 
Sure. I think David's got a question as well. That's okay. Mm -hmm. David, you're on mute at the moment, David. Sorry. Um, earlier on, I put a question in the chat about um, the the uh, where the folds cause difficulties, but I'd like to ask a question here as well because it seems to me that this y variable is of um, isn't it of absolutely huge dimension potentially, um, and um, I mean, is it? Yeah, so I wondered if it really works with the gradient descent. Yeah, so um, um, so we are hiding a bit of complexity inside CY. So Y here is a function basically that maps uh, from one point to another point. And what we do internally, so we have a representation of the deformation. I will come to this in just two or three slides, but we have a coarse representation of the deformation. So we have a grid of coarse points or coarse grid of points across the image, regular grid, uh, that represents the deformation. And this is of a much coarser resolution than the actual image. And this makes it handleable, handleable for registration and optimization. Yeah. So, so the, <clears throat> this method is really um, co confined to the situation where the, the edges are very well defined and if, if they're two different if they're two different um, sections adjacent sections then um, it is, wouldn't it be unusual for the edges to be so match so well yeah I mean so if you so if your two sections are so different that you have difficulty to find like similarly shaped objects so then it becomes difficult right so um but yeah so this is maybe this <laughs> one of my takeaways for image registration is also so you can't can only align what you can also where you can visually point out the similarities in the two images and if you so i mean for example here uh, you have this this is very far away right it's difficult to tell here but here this sec this this bubble or whatever it is here this uh, lumen uh, and this one here. So they will correspond to each other and this will be a gradient. I mean, you can see it from here. Um, and the more you zoom in, the more of these gradients you will find um, independently of the stain, more or less. And if you go, of course, as more, so the more you go, or the more the two sections are apart, the more difficult it becomes to find these corresponding structures. Um, but then it's also the question, so what is the goal behind the registration? So if you can't find anything that matches between the two sections, then it becomes also the question, what are you going to, to do with the registration in the end? Um. Great, so I think we, we'll, have, we'll have one more question and then we'll move on if that's okay. So Saad. Hello, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, so there are a couple of questions. Uh, obviously, you know, as David also pointed out, there are a lot of subtleties there packed into this why and you know, in general, uh, how you handle the registration if there are topological differences. Right. If, uh, mm -hmm. if the topology is changing, and even though you know on the boundaries, etc., it's fine, but within the tissue itself, there is some kind of holes that are being created, or you know, are being destroyed, or whatever. So your course to find uh, registration is going to only go so far. And yeah. uh, and the other question is that. You know, mostly I've seen like the most of the registration algorithms are just, you know, uh, going from uh, what has already been done in the radiology domain in LBDMM and all these others and just applying it here. So what what's the difference between what you are doing and what has been done there? There we also have uh, grayscale images that we are registering here. Uh, I'm just wondering whether you take into account color information or you just also do grayscale registration and basically that's it. Mm -hmm. So um, so maybe the second question. So we just do grayscale images in the end. That's we use the same approaches as I said. It's also so the optimization framework. Everything is uh, what has been used in radiology uh, long before. My um, so. I had the impression that, um, so at least in Lübeck, we started image registration with sectioned brains in 2003 or so. 
um, so I'm not sure what was first, but maybe radiology was first. And maybe to the differences um, uh, to registration, how it's done in radi radiology, we can directly go to the next slide. Because now, so we now know how we can uh, interpret the similarity or difference between two images. And now um, I want to say a few words on how to find this optimal deformation. And what we do, we do it in three steps. We start with the pre-alignment. We have a fine registration and a deformable registration. The second, so the last two steps, so this is uh, also standard image registration, uh, not much different, I would say. Um, what we added for pathology specifically is this first step, this pre-alignment, because so the second two steps, so they rely on yeah, Gauss-Newton type optimization schemes. And the assumptions beyond, beyond these schemes is that we have um, a good initial guess. So they converge best if we are close to the optimum. And um, from our experiences is rarely given in pathology um, because we have slides that are yeah, rotated or yeah, don't, even, don't even have the same number of, uh, of tissues, uh, tissue parts on, on both slides and so on. So what we find is this pre-alignment is relatively important. Um, so this is no rocket science either. So um, I will go into a bit more detail. Uh, what we do along these steps is we increase the uh, image size and also the degrees of freedom for the deformation with, with each step. So yeah, first pre-alignment bring both tissues roughly in the same orientation, then we compensate for global translation, rotation, scaling, shearing, so this is a fine registration. And then we have a deformal registration um, where we have, a, as I said before, a grid of deformation cells that overlay the image and every cell can move more or less independently. And it, yeah, at each step, oh, it by gets the way, a bit like, more yeah. complex. The pre-alignment also is done in radiology too. So especially in uh, uh, cone beam CT versus CT, which have different field of views and don't match. So that's the standard uh, yeah. step. Yeah, but my, my impression was in, radio, in radiology, you at least know where up is, right? So uh... Uh, sometimes even that's an issue depending on the scanner and the acquisition. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, so um, what we do is uh, also relatively simple. So we just overlay the center of mass uh, of the two uh, sections. Um, and then we rotate a number of times, k times, 32 times, for example. And at each time we start a small rigid registration um, at each of these angles. And um, we do it at a coarse resolution, uh, such that uh, the whole thing is relatively fast. And then we compare the image distances in the end, we just use the best result as an initial guess uh, to the second steps. And this prevents in most cases that we end up in like a local minimum. Um, and where our method uh, struggles most if, yeah, if this initial guess is not good. So this happens sometimes, as I said, if there are different number of tissue parts on both images, so we don't have a really good solutions for this. If, uh, someone uh, has ideas or knows of uh, robust solutions for this, I would be happy to talk about this after the talk. Um, so this is what we see as the, yeah, for us, the biggest problem in registration to make us really robust to have this done automatically. Um, okay, yeah, then do, second. In the three, three uh, sorry, in the last uh, slide, do you do stain normalization before you take the grayscale images as an input? Or do you just do grayscale and just take it as an input? We ju just grayscale, but we use these normalized gradients, which do this kind of normalization in the end. So we don't need to do normalization before. OK, and then, yeah, we have a fine registration. Maybe just briefly talk about how this is done. We have this objective function that, in this case, only consists of the uh, distance measure. We have this parameter, uh, six parameters for the affine registration. Um, and we do a Gauss-Newton optimization. So this uh, is also, uh, so you do a Taylor expansion of the a derivative of the objective function. And then you say you have an update step S and if this is the optimal update step, then the gradient becomes zero. So you get this uh, system of equations and you have then some a convergence criterion uh, that um, tells you when, once you're done and you loop uh, through the Gauss-Newton Gauss optimization uh, until 
uh, yeah, you uh, have some converging uh, result. Um, and the result of this uh, affine registration goes then into the uh, deformable registration um, or nonlinear registration. And we now allow more degrees of freedom. So uh, in the deformation, so every pixel can move independently. And uh, this, of course, would be too much. Um, so we need uh, some kind of physical model uh, how we want our deformation to behave. And uh, we use uh, curvature regularization, um, which um, yeah, measures the energy that the deformation or that it takes to make this deformation. And we measure this uh, energy by a second order derivative. Um, and yeah, minimize both at the same time. And then you have a weight factor for this uh, regularizer part the, where you can like just uh, adjust how how much deformation you want to allow or how, yeah, how, yeah. If you place more weight on uh, regularity or more weight on the image similarity. And yeah, now we have all these three steps together and we can uh, actually do a registration. And I thought I would just um, show you this uh, in a brief demo. Um, so what we did, um, we put this whole uh, registration uh, algorithm into a web application uh, where people can uh, work on. Um, so you can contact me if you want to have an account and try this out for yourself. And uh, yeah, here we are. And what we can do now here is, um, so we have a bunch of images. You can also upload images um, and you can, so currently it can just do uh, image registration, maybe we uh, see if we can add like image analysis as well, but currently just only does registration. You can select uh, two sections, for example, these two. Um, can see them side by side. We can adjust all these parameters um, that I've been talking about uh, and just press start. So we've found the set of parameters that works relatively robust uh, on most images. We optimize, also we automated uh, certain parameter choices. And then, uh, so now we have registered the two images and we have this side-by-side -side view. You can look um, at the two images. Here we have this cases, uh, what we were talking about earlier. If there are some uh, tissue defects in the image, um, we also have this spy view where you have the reference or the fixed image in the background. And we're looking at the deformed template image in the foreground. And now you can uh, just uh, look at the uh, registration result and see if it's pleasing or not. And uh, as you can see here, uh, we have a region where we have uh, yeah, tissue tearing, tearing uh, in one of the two images and uh, of course, here it's difficult to get a good alignment, right? We would need an extreme deformation, and this would not be covered by this curvature deformation model because this would tear the deformation apart, and this is basically infinite energy. Uh, so we don't allow this. Well, uh, we keep everything else aligned. Here's the alignment pretty good over here, also pretty good over here. And where it's difficult, where the algorithm cannot make out an alignment, uh, the regularizer takes over and just continues the deformation in a smooth way. And we can also look at this deformation. Unfortunately, we don't have this in the um, in the online viewer, but we can do this offline if I find my window. Uh, just a second. Ah, here we go. Um, maybe it's already the right one. Not sure. Just takes the last one. I downloaded. So we downloaded the. Yeah, it's the. Uh, it's already the aligned. Uh, version. So this is the deformation grid. After registration, we see some smaller nonlinearities here, for example. I hope you can see this uh, through Zoom. Um, but overall, this is a pretty uh, regular deformation. And um, yeah, one thing you might want to say, okay, now, um, what about this, uh, this region over here? Can we get a better alignment maybe to we relax the regularizer a bit? Um, so um, you can just say, okay, the regularizer is now uh, less important. Let's just do the registration again. Mm. Wait a few seconds. 
Okay, now we can look again. And at first sight, this looks much better now. Um, but if we zoom in a bit closer, then we see that we get some really ugly uh, deformation going on here. So we, we need this regularization in order to get like physically reasonable results. And you can also see this uh, if we go back into our registration viewer and look at the results. So this is how it shouldn't look like, right? So this is um, uh, extreme deformation, so multiple parts of the image. And this is what you wouldn't uh, want to have in your registration. And this can also be, so we can de detect this kind of uh, folding uh, automatically uh, to give also feedback on uh, registration quality. Johannes, it's okay, we have one question from David. Of course, yeah. Well, I, I, I was going to ask exactly about folding and what kind of problems this creates. Yeah. So. Yeah, so folding is difficult because you can't really fix this by registration, right? So if you have, if you have an overfold of tissue, this, so you, it's, the information is just not there in the image. You can't unfold it. Um, uh, so the best that you can do from my point of view is to um, yeah, have a reasonable transformation around the corrupted tissue parts and yeah, just deal with it uh, in, the, in the area in between. Would it be useful to have as a pre-processing step a tissue fold detection model and then use some different transformation within the tissue fold? Or yeah, so we, uh, yeah, we, we tried this, but yeah, in the end, so what we could do is to say, tell the deformation, okay, here's a, a line at which you can, where we can disconnect the deformation points from each other and basically ignore the regularization and then it can overlap a bit more smoothly. So this, seems to work but of course it's a lot of work to really get this done and uh, yeah includes manual steps and so on so we didn't follow this much further but um, yeah, I think so mathematically it's a bit interesting because you can really play around with the optimization and um, yeah great Saad yeah exactly so that's exactly what i was about to say that you have these uh, hierarchical control points from global to uh, local steps which can be used to isolate some of the regions uh, where you need more refinement right um, and uh, uh, ignore the parts where things are already good enough so yeah. the optimization doesn't like destroy the global um, uh, structure in any sense uh, from radiology domain again, like there is this uh, optimal mass transport regularization that has become really famous in registration uh, in the past two, three years. Um, and what that does, it allows you to handle these situations with folds really well. And the code is already available in UNC Mark Newt-Hammer's GitHub. So it might be worth just adding that in place of the curvature actually, and it'll do the same thing, but uh, taking the topological differences in program and it's really yeah yeah sounds very interesting maybe if you could like just drop a link or a title or yes, something I, in can, the chat, I then, can i can do that uh, I can. this would be great yeah thank you and i would just have to close this door here just one second please okay <laughs> Great, are you back? Yeah, family's hey, coming home. <laughs> hey, great. It's just one question before we move on, if that's okay, from Nasir. So he says, first of all, it's a really cool app. I think we all think that it looks, looks really great. Um, so he said, when a user uploads their images, can they then download the cross large transformations to take back to their analytical pipelines? Um, yes, yeah, so we currently, so we um, have the option to download the deformation. Um, which is uh, more or less useful. So we are currently looking into standardizing this, right? And, and big picture to have like a common understanding of what does this deformation mean? Um, what we also do, so you can, can upload annotations, points, uh, polygons or something like this, and uh, then download uh, transformed uh, annotations uh, to continue to work on. So this is possible, a uh, relatively new feature. <laughs> That's very cool. Just a quick follow-up question, if I may. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Is, is that okay? Um, yeah, so, so uh, I, I would imagine that, um, you know, just downloading the transformations is probably not going to be sufficient 
for most uh, people, you, they will probably need some other code to go hand in hand with those transformations to be able to use those transformations in their own downstream application. So is there any of this code available in the open source domain that, that could be utilized for that purpose? Uh, we published a few, um, so um, we have a few like small scripts, right? Uh, to um, use the deformation and apply it to annotations, for example. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we have something open source for image transformation, but so if you have annotations, you could uh, use some of our yeah, scripting to, to continue to work with this, yeah. Thanks. We're welcome to carry okay. on, anybody. Um, okay, so now we have seen how this works, but we didn't talk much about accuracy. And also, uh, one of the questions earlier was uh, on uh, restained and consecutive sections. And we um, looked at this together with uh, Jeroen van der Laak uh, from uh, Nijmegen. Um, and looked at consecutive and restained sections and uh, yeah, which accuracy can we get uh, out of these. And we have an interesting data set from a research project where we have a, a set of consecutive sections. So these four here are consecutive. So they are really cut from, this, uh, from the same block and then uh, stained differently. And we have the first section that was um, first scanned. Uh, so it was first stained, of course, for I think first immunist to chemistry, then it was scanned, then the cover slip was removed again, it was bleached, stained, and then scanned again. So we have really the same tissue on these two sections. And we can see this here, if we zoom in and the sections A and E, which are restained, we can really see that we have the same uh, cells in the images, which we don't have in the neighboring section, right? We have, see, can see roughly the same structure, but we don't see the same cells. And um yeah the question was here so how can how accurate can the registration be in both of these cases and uh, what kind of structures can we align with it and yeah we looked at this so here we have results from deformable registration and compared restained versus consecutive and so this graph here reads as follows so we have uh, the bottom three boxes are the consecutive sections and the upper box plot is from the restained sections. And we did a couple of registrations. And this is a total of, I think, from these sets of five, uh, we have nine blocks, I think, that were registered. And we did this at different image resolutions. So we started at a really coarse image resolution and then made the image resolution finer all the time up to 25,000 times 50, 55,000, which is about the maximum that we can compute on a like a regular computer because yeah memory is an issue here and we compared the accuracies and so the first thing that we can see is that the restained sections are always a lot more accurate or yeah better aligned than the consecutive sections and what i also find it's not surprising but it's interesting that you can also see the uh, the order of the uh, serial sections right you can see they have the lowest order on the sections that was closest to the H and E and the more you get away from it the less accurate it gets and um, yeah we obtain one to two micrometers uh, on the restrained sections and we go up to uh, I think in, in the mean or in the median overall it's a 13 micrometers of accuracy but it's, it depends largely on uh, on how close and how similar the two sections are Questions to this a plot while we're at it? Yes. <laughs> so, so the CD45, it seems, is causing the biggest issue, right? So, uh, CD8, KI67, PHH3 are, uh, um, at least KI67 and PHH3 are nuclear markers, whereas the uh, CD8 is somewhat cytoplasmic, but it's close to the nuclear boundary. So, the errors are bound to be low. But CD45 would cause way more. Trouble. So, do you have any uh, sense of you know what kind of markers and uh, what kind of artifacts that are incorporated uh, into these images would really throw things off? Uh, and I, I, I guess this is an open-ended. <laughs> There's no <laughs> definite answer to it. But uh, if you have any thoughts, having played with these images for such a long time. Um. 
Yeah, so maybe just one more word how we did this evaluation. So we uh, looked for landmarks that we could identify on all of the five images, which is a bit tedious because you have to look at all of them at the same time. Um, and then we set yeah, landmarks on these points and then measured landmark distance in the end, which is not perfect. Uh, I think like having like, yeah, annotated structures is larger structures would be better, but um, yeah, it's something that is feasible at least. Um, for the other question, so I'm not sure. So in my experience, this doesn't matter too much what stain there is, but um, yeah, so I, I can't so remember, but it's more like a gut yeah. feeling, right? Uh, yeah. Can't remember so, any stain specific uh, um, artifacts so or so. The complexity uh, that you are showing here in terms of the TRD or the registration error is actually what aligns with the intuition perfectly, which is, you know, what are more complex mark markers versus what are less complex. So definitely PHS3, K67, you will get less registration error when you move to HER2, PDO1, and these kind of markers, which is membranous slash cytoplasmic, mm -hmm. then that will be way more difficult because they kind of hide the underlying structure at times depending on the expression level that you have mm. but wouldn't i see the same structures still no those, you, you, th those might be completely hidden dependent on you know how many how much expression is there the brown dab expression for example mm -hmm. that's interesting so maybe we'll have to look into this so this is also a work in progress and uh, not really published yet so maybe it's a good <laughs> a good thing to look into this again so I think what, what we'll do is we'll now um, hold off on questions until the end, if that's okay, just so we can make sure that we get through the presentation and yeah. then we'll um, hopefully have a nice discussion afterwards. Yeah. Um, okay. okay, so the second thing we looked at is uh, deformable versus fine registration. Uh, so, um, and again, for consecutive and for restained sections, um, so we have here a fine registration in red and deformable in orange. Uh, and in consecutive sections, you can see clearly, yeah, so it's a clear advantage of uh, deformable registration. Um, going down, yeah, you, so what we see here also, you don't need the full image resolution for consecutive sections because there's just uh, not enough alignment to get really to this low, uh, uh, to this low errors. Um, if you go to uh, restained sections, then um, first these scales are different, right? So there's a, at least a factor of 10 between them. So this is all down here, uh, much more accurate. Um, and uh, first we see that um, the accuracies are much more similar. Um, and the difference of these, so we see medians over all landmarks here. So the uh, medians are not so different which also means that if you don't need this extra mile, and this was one question from the beginning, right? So if you don't need the difference from one to two microns uh, of error, then you are, can go ahead with the affine registration. Also knowing that the uh, quartiles are still much higher. Um, but if this is okay, then you can get away with much uh, slimmer or shorter workflow. I mean, you can compute a global or fine registration with a few landmarks, right? So there's no optimization required if this, if this is enough. And if you, so we have seen some nonlinearity still in the images that bring down the registration error uh, a bit further and also require higher image resolutions. Okay, and... Um, maybe a final look at restained images. Does this work? Yes. So while, while this website is coming up, just on your last slide, yeah. I'm sorry, Simon, I'm asking this. So I'm just wondering <laughs> how different is the speed of the form of the registration and a fine registration? Because this, the, the accuracy is quite the same when you do the restaining, right? But what, what in, terms, in terms of speed, I mean, yeah, so if you go to this high image resolutions, then yeah, I, yeah, I'm not sure actually. I would have to go in and measure this. Um, so it depends on the optimization of the registration. So we did a lot of optimization of the deformable registration because it usually takes a lot more time because it's a lot more mm. free variables to optimize. So that in the end, in our implementation, the, there's not such a big difference. But um, of course, in a fine registration is much. So if you apply the same 
amount of optimization, uh, then you are much faster, uh, of course. And as okay. I said, you can also just set three landmarks, right? So <laughs> this uh, goes down to the same results. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. Thanks. And um, yeah, we can uh, zoom in here a bit and use this spy tool, look at the correspondences. So this is always, okay, here's a relatively large offset, right? Um, but for restained uh, sections, we usually see very good alignment. You can really see that we have the same uh, the same uh, nuclei in both images. Here's a bit of a difference. Uh, so here's a bit of a shift, right? So often, so from my experience, we often see this if something is like free floating, then this can happen. This is that it moves a bit. Um, but yeah, there's a good, uh, very good alignment with these restrained sections, and it makes it a good uh, candidate for, yeah, if you just want to transfer annotations for uh, deep learning training, for example, then this works really well. Um, um, yeah. So this mm -hmm. took about three minutes on our platform to compute, and I think so. Maybe there's some, if you play around with the parameters a bit, there could be a bit more accuracy at some point. So. Uh, it also always depends where you where you uh, scroll in. <laughs> um, okay. Um, is this is this the 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 HN image? Is this PHS three staining? No, I so not a pathologist, right? Um, so PHS three is a blue one and. Uh, H and E it can be that the H and E is uh, a bit differently calibrated, but I'm not so sure about this. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, this is already my uh, almost la last slide. So uh, my conclusions, um, as I said, so what you see is what you get at most. So if you don't see the uh, corresponding structures in both images, uh, where's my image? Ah, okay. Uh, it's just black. Hmm. Okay, here we go. Um, so for, this is from the unhear uh, uh, challenge data. So unhear is the automatic non-linear image registration in histology, something like this a challenge. And um, so there are uh, images where the both image uh, where both sections are really different. So um, and this is difficult to register. So where where would you point this? Uh, so how would you want to deform this to bring this on top of each other? It's just uh, difficult. So what you see is what you, so if you put good quality slides in, then your results will be much better. And also for serial sectioning, um, the closer the, face, the sections are, the better the results will be. And uh, yeah, from my experience also makes sense to talk to the people in the lab doing these sections to tell them what you're trying to do. and um, then you also get better results, mostly. And yeah, if you can uh, use uh, recent sections, of course, um, as we have seen, they are much more accurate. And uh, yeah, deformable registration is still a bit more accurate also on restrained slides, but of course, mostly also on uh, consecutive sections. Um, and this is my last point. And um, I would be happy for discussion. And if you want to contact me, I'm on Twitter or email. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Johannes. That's a great presentation. Particularly the demos were were amazing. So thanks for that. I love that tool where you hover over and then you can see the different stain. That's yeah. that's great. So yeah, like you said, I think we can open the floor to some questions. So first, if I just um, ask a question that Nasir asked early on in your presentation, and it was to do with the the three D reconstruction. So Nasir asked, is there an upper limit on the section thickness when, when utilizing this approach? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, there is. So we did um, reconstructions from like 200, a stack of 200. Um, and then there are different approaches that you can do. So um, what we did there is we just started in the middle and registered the next slide on top of it. And then we registered the next slide on the deformed slide and so on. Uh, until you're at the end of the stack. But this, of course, then you have always something from the middle of the stack as reference and the tissues changes over uh, time or over the uh, Z direction. And um, yeah, this is not so easy to tackle. Uh, there are better approaches that are, but 
computationally much more expensive where you basically optimize all the pairwise registrations at once where you have like a joint distance measure between all these light pairs and then you optimize this all together which we never really tried but uh, from theory i think this would be the better approach if we're really going to go into 3d uh, yeah right so i was actually just wondering if you tried any experiments with different tissue thicknesses um for example you know three micron works much better than um, five micron or seven or ten what, what's the kind of upper limit where it just breaks it just does not work anymore did, I'm, did yeah i'm not sure if that is there. That? yeah i'm not sure if there's like a, a threshold right so the the thinner the sections are and the more similarities you have between the sections the better your uh, our alignment is of course and you just get less accurate right you always will find so you can always find the outer boundary a boundary of the tissue and just overlay this and but this doesn't help you much if there's nothing in between that gives you any information right um so yeah right so johannes i'd love to hear a bit more about so what you found from participating in the registration challenge so for example, you spoke about these three steps of registration. Did you find that other participants use also a similar three steps? Um, what, what do you think you learn from the best solutions to that challenge? Yeah, so, so actually we developed this uh, first step during the challenge because we, so it was the first time where we really had to do this fully automatically with uh, images that we weren't allowed to like directly see, right? So we we are looking for something automatic. Um, I know of some approaches using deep learning for the registration. Um, and I'm not sure how this works in the uh, in the initial alignment. Um, and yes, then uh, not such a clear takeaway, right? So there were some deep learning based approaches which were, uh, worked apparently pretty well. Uh, but also like standard approaches, a combination of uh, existing tools and pool together and then selecting the best one also. So one approach I think from uh, Hesso uh, worked relatively well, uh, in a similar range of accuracy than ours, uh, just by using existing methods and then uh, recombining the results and uh, picking the best one, broadly speaking, maybe oversimplified, but yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, um, I, I have a... I have a quick question, please. Yes, Sajid, you go first, yeah. that's okay. Then we'll come over on to yeah. David afterwards. Yeah, uh, thank you, Johannes, for such an exciting talk. It was really um, and, um, and useful. Just a quick question. Um, any idea or notion about vision transformer for this image registration task? Yeah, so sorry, uh, no, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I really didn't look very deeply into all this uh, neural network based registration um, but I, I mean people have been so maybe it would be something for another talk uh, mm -hmm. but yeah no sorry <laughs> mm -hmm. okay that's fine no problem thank you i'd like to ask a um, sort of practical question um, have have you found that um, the equipment used to cut the sections uh, affects the quality of the sections from the point of view of um, registration. I mean, I was particularly thinking of the fact that uh, I, I, have, I have seen when, when uh, sometimes when a section is cut, the, um, some, some objects are actually moved, which uh, obviously would make the uh, registration more difficult. I mean, they'd move, yeah, they'd move, move on uh, maybe above, but not below. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I wondered if you'd noticed uh, anything or if you any remarks about the quality of cutting. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So for me, that's difficult. So we, so it's difficult to get for me for us in contact with the people doing the cutting. So uh, it's really difficult to find out what actually happened in the lab. Uh, I think that um, paraffin embedded uh, slides work much better than uh, frozen sections. 
but I mean, this is also relatively obvious when looking at the slides. And um, yeah, apart from this, I have no no insights. No, sorry. Okay, I think we have one one more question. So I'm I'm currently in a room actually with about twelve to fifteen other people, Johannes. Um, so we've got one question from somebody in the room. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll sure. I'll try and be quick. Um, so thanks for talking, Johannes. But I was wondering if you if maybe it comes under the data quality you talked about earlier. But if you have like one slide, like an HD one that has lots of artifacts in it, like pen marks and those sort of things, and like an IHC one that does not, how well does the, the, the approach deal with situations like that? Does that kind of fall into the folding category where it's kind of quite difficult to actually get them to line up in that way? I just wonder if you have any remarks on that. Yeah, so this is difficult to do this automatically, right? So if, I mean, mm -hmm. if it's outside, so if it's just in one section and not in the other, then this is not such a big problem because it's usually then you have these marks outside of the tissue and then it's on the background and uh, so there's no normalized gradient between white a flat white background and a, a mark in the foreground so this doesn't generate uh, something that the distance measure is able to see um, but sometimes this overlaps and then the tissue gets sucked into something that uh, someone has marked on the section for example uh, what we do in these cases just to have a mask that uh, uh, yeah masks these annotations out and then you can ignore it. That's the easiest case, but of course difficult to do automatically. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you have time for one more question? I have time, yeah, sure. <laughs> right. So Dang, who's also in the room, has asked, have you found a way to automatically quantify slides that could that could not be registered or a quantitative score on registration quality? Yeah, it's also difficult. So you can look at the something like the image distance and at the deformation energy after registration. Um, but I so I didn't find a conclusive answer. So when to say it doesn't work? So it's uh, kind of difficult. Of course, if you have foldings in the tissue, this is often a sign that something went wrong. Um, but yeah, I was also something that would be interesting to me. So people want to have this, right? So they want to have this uh, traffic light approach where it's red when something didn't work out and someone has to look at it and have it run fully automatic. But I am not aware of something that works robustly. Okay. Well, I think we're over time now. So I think with that, we can conclude the seminar. So th thanks again, Johannes, for delivering a brilliant presentation. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, really appreciate you um you coming along and, and making that great presentation. And hopefully I'll we'll, we'll see you at some point soon. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a nice nice afternoon. Bye bye. bye, -bye. You, bye, -bye.